first of first of all uh, good evening everyone thanks for joining in the webinar we have around 19 participants uh, two of them have just got dropped somehow they would have logged on from mobile so uh, today's uh, title is the age of imperfect leader uh, and the presenter is pavan verma uh, pavan verma ji is a industry veteran who comes from uh, fintech and insurance tech background uh, he has spent around 3 decades of career in the same industry in his last assignment he was uh, uh, ceo of a uh, insurance major and uh, i my association with pavan ji goes back to last 4 uh, years uh, we connect in a rotary uh, club and uh, that's a rotary club of millennium city and uh, thanks pavan ji for uh, agreeing to uh, share or uh, this talk on your latest book and it would be good to know that pavan ji has authored around 12 books by now so this is not the first time so one more session i have been requesting from him is how to become a author so we start with uh, the age of imperfect uh, leader and uh, going ahead we would have other talk interesting talks from pavan ji himself uh, thank you so much for your time and guidance pavan ji over to you thank you chintan bhai for organizing this meeting on the cloud and i'm extremely happy to be with all of you friends uh, in your intellectual companionship i would like to discuss today uh, the issue which Uh, concerns all of us greatly and the leadership uh, in this book uh, age of the imperfect leader that i have written recently it has been published this month itself it's about leadership and the central question that i ask in this book is would you like to be good at everything at the cost of being great at something that is i will repeat would you like to be good at everything at the cost of being great at something and why i am asking this question is that if you look at the journey of our life in our if you look around the society our general focus has been that we are told to become well balanced persons in life the first priority that we are we are asked to hold is to get over our, our weaknesses control our weaknesses manage our weaknesses in the process what happens this is a very dangerous proposition that i have observed and research also has observed that it's a very dangerous proposition because it promotes among all of us among the people it promotes mediocrity and uh, i have nothing against mediocrity a lot of us a lot of us including myself are mediocre you know yes nothing wrong about it and i remember one incident in my public sector life when i was working for a big public sector may be mot uh in a all india meeting where the top leadership of the uh, company was there i was telling them as to why is it that they are promoting mediocrity and there was a lot of raised eyebrows on me and during the lunch time one of the directors caught hold of me and he said that pavan what is your problem with mediocrity i am a mediocre and what is your problem with me i said look here sir i don't have a problem with you but i have a problem with any institution systematically promoting mediocrity because what we need today in life in society in industry is excellence lot of people i mean we should aim at excellence a lot of people will fall to be mediocre because of the competition no doubt about it so nothing against mediocrity mediocres but certainly we should as a matter of system promote uh excellence so i would like to say that uh if you spend your life trying to be good at everything you will never be great at anything now you can uh, ask me naturally you know what what is it connect with leadership what it has to do with leadership it has to it has a great connect with leadership and i will explain it but before that before i do that i would like to raise a question as to what is leadership you know what do we understand by leadership you know uh leadership has been defined 
in n number leadership uh there was one mr uh, joseph rost he wrote a book leadership for the 21st century and he collected uh 321 definitions of leadership throughout the from 1920s onwards to 1990s and then the central theme was that how the leaders influence the followers that was the central theme the basic thing is of leadership impact of leadership is the influence how one influences the other and that's the only thing that has been changing since the beginning well in the sense that in the 1920s and 30s the leaders used to tell the uh, followers as to what to do how to do when to do whereas today in the 90s in the two, uh, in the new millennium you know it is the followers as well as the leaders who both influence each other it's not only the leader who influences the followers the followers also influence the leader so leadership is basically influence so and if i am a parent in the i could be a prime each of us every one of us is a leader right because each of us influence a group of people in some uh, environment or the other and at some times at most of the times we are followers but there are moments when we are leaders and that's why it is very very uh relevant to leadership what i said earlier about our societal focus on managing our weaknesses primarily it has a great of great impact on leadership you know i would also like to say that leadership demands excellence you know, and it cannot come out of mediocrity you know it has there has to be excellence for leadership you know the second part i would like to say that there's a big gap between leadership theories and leadership practice the leadership practice has developed over the years and leaders have attuned themselves to the circumstances greatly for example today we are in a working in a flat world in a transparent world and leaders have tuned themselves to this but unfortunately you will find that the leadership theories have not uh, have not changed they are still looking for that perfect leader and then what happens out of this that each leadership institute or each leadership author has its own set of traits mandated traits that a leader should have he should be a visionary he should be a great executioner he could be a great planner he should be a great communicator right everything he should be there so this is the sort of perfection even if you look at daniel uh, goldman he says that a leader should be coercive authoritative affiliative democratic participative and coaching and all in right measure at right moment now as it happens we are made of certain dna certain types and we cannot keep on changing personalities by the hour by the demand of the hour or demand of the day we have our own limitations so to expect that a leader will be all of these is to expect the moon so it's not possible it's far away from the reality of life you know so the leader is expected to uh, know what is to be done how it is to be done when it is to be done he will get it done he is a great executioner he will a great he is a great visionary he has subjective iq and eq and he can uh, romance the his followers he can transform his followers and do everything you know that's the expectations from the leader and so the an image of the leader that we are building is of an infallible omnipotent person you know a pilot who doesn't need a co-pilot a man who doesn't need a co-pilot you know he single handedly can deliver a thing you know so uh, when it comes to say a great author like a leadership author like john maxwell he says a leader knows the way he shows the way he goes the way that means the all important all knowing person who is a leader this kind of a uh, perception of leadership is creating a lot of problem in the world you know the problem is that first it is given to the wrong leadership models 
where you are trying to create perfect leadership. Whereas there's nothing perfect in the world, in the entire new universe, there's no perfection. The universe itself is perfect. Perfect. So, uh, well, so out of the imperfection, when you try to create a perfection, then there's a problem. You know? Because if I am a budding leader, if I have just stepped in on the leadership uh, ladder, what happens? I go to a leadership institute and I'm told that a leader should have all these 10 uh, attributes, traits. Uh, then what two things happen? Either I get frustrated that, no, this is not my cup of tea. I can't become a leader. Or what happens that I start learning all those skills, non-existent skills in me. So if I don't have a sense of humor, I start learning how to be humorous. I, if I am not a great planner, I start becoming a planner, right? If I'm not a great organizer, I try to become an organizer. I start learning these things. So I keep on wasting my energy and wasting my opportunity on the traits which I don't have, which are my weaknesses. And in the process, I lose out on the opportunity of being excellent in the area in which I have a strength. I have a clear and formidable strength. So that's the loss of opportunity. And so you find it prevails, you know. Similar thing happens in the society also. If you look at this, under parental pressure, under societal pressure, uh, we get into IITs, we get into LAM, we get into medical profession. And then what happens that we have mediocre doctors, we have mediocre engineers, we have medi mediocre planners and managers, you know, everywhere, you know. So systematically we are promoting mediocrity and the present uh, theories on leadership, the practice, uh, not practice, but the theories and uh, understanding of leadership, which promotes perfection, not excellence, creates this, adds to this problem, you know. Now, uh, the impact of this happens, the other impact it happens that when for to even to the established leaders, two things happen, you know, they start uh, keeping a wrong face. Have you come across leaders who don't understand their financial statements of their company, but still they pose that they understand it. The leaders who don't understand the IT, information technology, but they will pose, they will never say that uh, I don't understand IT and in, or investment. And in the process, what they will do, they will try to set the agenda for IT or investment or finance and lead the company to disaster. You know. So that's one impact of it. The other impact of this kind of a trade-based leadership is that quite often uh, leaders start imitating one of their icons. You would remember that uh, when Jack Welch was at the helms of GE, electricals, electricals. At that point of time, there were a lot of people who were uh, imitating Jack Welch. You know, his style of speaking, his style of thinking, his style of delivery. And so what happened? You know, None of those people, copycats who were there, they could succeed. While Jack Welch, the original, is still a phenomenon today, you know, right? Let's take a, an example back home. Those who are interested in music will remember that Mukesh, the famous legendary singer, you know, when he started, he started, uh, he, he was imitating K.L. Sagal, right? But he didn't have a success as a K.L. Sagal. He had a success, phenomenal success, only when he started his own original style, Mukesh. And he became a great singer, you know. After Mohammad Rafi and Kishore Kumar died, a lot of people started imitating his, their style. But none of them were successful because after having seen the original, who is going to see the copy? However good copy it is, you know. So what happens, you know, and the other kind of imitation is there, you know. I had a uh, uh, leader. I once had a CEO of a company in the company, which had joined new. And what happened that he, right from the very beginning, right from the day of joining, he started to prove 
that whatever the company had done in the past was wrong, was useless. And so whatever propositions were made or whatever the statements of the company were there, he used to send to his nephew in London, the company was in, in India, he used to send it to a, his nephew in a company in London in the same sector and get some, try to get some validation of his points, of his objections. Now you can understand this kind of a problem when somebody starts, you know, trying to pose that he's a master of all trades. He understands everything, you know. Okay, and the problem for the company. There is, have you heard the story of a leader who every time who went to a conference and came back from here, there, called the management meeting and said, whatever he had learned in the conference, for example, it, if it was change management, he would say, you know, we must focus on change management. And oblivious of the fact that the company would have undergone a change only recently. You, know, you need a stability at that point of time. Or shareholder wealth, increasing shareholder wealth, or customer centricity, whatever he heard. So this is a, another form of imitation, you know, that I'm, I must be perfect. I must be above the normal. Uh, person, you know, and so I must look to be higher than the others. So that's the problem we create for the company when we do it, you know, in the process, we uh, don't have adequate commitment to the team, we harm the company also, you know. So I think it's this, I would like to uh, present to you the true face of leadership. What is the true face of leadership? which are in our recent memory. As against the theories of trait-based perfect leaders, I give you the example of Mahatma Gandhi, the imperfect leaders, you know, and say that, okay, this is the real character, the true face of leaders. Mahatma Gandhi, by any chance, was he perfect? Absolutely no. By his own ad admission, in his book, my experiments with truth. He has confessed that he was not a good father. He was not a good son. He was not a good husband. He has started doubt. He was doubting the character of his uh, wife, Kasturba, and uh, he was not allowing her to move around freely at the same time. And this is all on his admission, not somebody else accusing him of that. You know. On his own admission again, he was the person who was sleeping naked with uh, young nubile ladies, women, you know. And when uh, Shoshila Nair, who was in 1947, when she was 33 years old, she was considered old enough. And then she was replaced by Manu, the grand niece of Mahatma Gandhi, to sleep with him naked, you know, to test his perseverance to patience, sexual control. Now, even in today's liberalized society, comparatively liberalized society, we can't accept that person like a leader with such moral aberrations. Come, this is his personal life. Forget about his personal life. Come to his public life. He was a highly self-opinionated person. Right? Remember the Chaudi Chaudi uh, incident? where he suspended the nationwide hesitation when uh, four policemen were killed as, against the advice of everybody, Nehru and everybody else. In 1939, when Subhash Chandra Bose uh, was elected as the president of the Congress party, he started uh, non-cooperating with Subhash Chandra Bose to the extent that Subhash Chandra Bose had to resign from the party presidentship and he went away and took an entirely different course for the freedom struggle. And you all know the story of uh, how uh, Jawaharlal Nehru became the president of India, uh, president of uh, Congress party, and subsequently the prime minister of India, consequently the prime minister of India. In 1946, when it was very clear that uh, uh, Britishers were supposed to go, were going out, leaving the country, the Congress president was supposed to become the prime minister of India. Now, for this election of the Congress president, only the regional Congress committees, 15 of them were there. They were entitled to nominate. 
Maulana Abul Kalam Ajad wanted to continue as a president next term, but Gandhi said no. And then nominations were called for. 12 out of 15 nominations came for Sardar Patel, but Gandhi rejected it. He asked J.B. Kripalani to move the CWC, Congress Working Committee, which was not authorized to nominate, to propose the name of Jawaharlal Nehru. And that's how Nehru became the prime president of Congress party and consequently the prime minister of India, the first prime minister of India. So that's the story. So a highly undemocratic person, a highly, uh, in terms of character, questionable character view, even to, by today's standards, we say. But then why it is that Gandhi became a transformational leader that we all know and we revere, and we have given him uh, very lovingly the father of the nation title. It was something, it, it was his strength. He ignored his weaknesses. And in fact, he converted his weaknesses into his strengths. And how he did it, you know? It was he who declared all his weaknesses. It was not somebody else pointing the, his fingers on Mahatma Gandhi. It's Gandhi said, he's coming with his commitment to truth and nonviolence. He said, truth must be told, whatever be the consequences. And so he told, the truth about himself. And that's the beauty of Gandhi. He converted his strengths, weaknesses into his strengths and deflected all the attention from his weaknesses. So his strength became more noticeable and became productive. So likewise, <clears throat> when you see uh, his commitment to nonviolence, you know, not only Chauri Chara, he did not even protect Bhagat Singh, Sukhdev and Rajguru in that Lahore case from uh, getting hanged. Because he said they have committed violent means and so he, he will not support. So it is his commitment, his communication was so good. Yatra, you know. Uh, kilometer journey. So much so that he uh, covered it in 24 days and the entire Western media was also glued as to see the problems, the deprivation, the poverty that Indians are undergoing. You know. So that was his power of communication. When he stood before uh, the uh, British emperor in 1931 after the round table meet for a photograph, the British emperor was in full three-piece suit, Gandhi in his half-clad dhoti. The picture together made it very clear that who was looting India, who were the culprits of keeping India under poverty. You know. Without saying a word, he communicated to the entire world the misery that India was facing. So that's the beauty of Gandhi, his leadership. So the central point that I'm uh, trying to make out is that it is not his weaknesses that prevailed. It is his strengths. So Gandhi became a leader on the basis of his strengths. He was not perfect. He was highly imperfect. Take another example. From today, you all of you are aware, Donald Trump, the president of America, I need not list his weaknesses. You know. He admits it. He has told them all. And they are all over, you know. And uh, what you call the law, uh, loss of character, the moral depravity that he used to talk about even his daughter in the locker room. And he dismisses it as locker room, as if it's not important, it's nothing bad, you know. His wife, Melania Trump, when she joined him uh, during the um, uh, elections in 2016, uh, she was taunted as, you know, she will bring transparency to the White House, you know. Now imagine after eight years of very decent uh, presidentship by uh, Obama, Barack Obama and Michelle Obama, what decent couple they were. Anybody would have, would anybody have uh, accepted Donald Trump as the leader of the biggest power in, on earth today? And why it happened? You know, 22 women had lost official complaint against President Donald Trump in 2016 during his election that they have been sexually molested or exploited. 
and still the American public didn't react, didn't say anything, because Donald Trump was acting on his strength. His strength was that he wanted to make America great again, because America was going downhill, even under Obama, because of his pacifist policies, America was losing the global influence. The Medicare, uh, Obamacare was getting very costly. Jobs were getting lost. Economy was sluggish. And when Trump gave the call that let, let's uh, make America great again, people listened to him. That here was this businessman who was successful. And if he can succeed in making his business an empire, yes, he can make, lead America to greatness again. You know. So that was the kind of a approach to leadership. Again, it is the strength of Donald Trump that has prevailed over his weaknesses. He is no longer, nothing short of a perfect leader, but it's his weakness. So you see the difference between uh, the leadership theories and the leaders in practice. You know. So the problem is, uh, and let me tell you also that it's not that Americans are averse to uh, sexual misbehavior or misconduct or something. In the right now, uh, in this age only, you remember when the Me Too uh, movement came, uh, that Weinstein, Harvey Weinstein was sacked. He is still under jail, right? Because of sexual transgressions. American public don't forgive this kind of a sexual transgression for people who are in position of authority. This happened with that. And again, uh, recently again, uh, uh, three, four years back, when uh, the CEO of Miss America uh, platform, he had said in 2013 something about Miss Maloney, who was the Miss America in 2013, in a private email to somebody. And at that time, he was not the CEO of Miss America platform. You know. And still he had to resign when it became public. You know. So that's the American people a standard for uh, leadership, of behavioral leadership. But still, in the face of all these, Trump became the leader of America. You know. uh, Dhoni, for example, I will not elaborate on it because I will get sort of MS Dhoni. The way he has transformed cricket, he is not only a captain, he is not only a hero, he is a legend today. You know. But he has a lot of weaknesses. He is a very bad communicator, right? He, his financial integrity on many of the issues are doubted. But nobody questions the leadership, you know. He's a lesson. Another example you look at is, for example, Albert Einstein. You know. Right? Einstein is a great, I need not uh, get into his strength because all of you know it better you know, than me. But he had terrible weaknesses, you know. The uh, once he loved his wife, and uh, two basic things have come out, you know, in his uh, collected papers of Einstein, where he says that after some time of his marriage, he puts so such conditions before his wife Miliva, and says, number one, you will always keep my uh, dress ironed out. You will always. Uh, mm, uh, accompanying for social relationship but whenever i tell you you will get out of my bedroom kind of that no and uh, you will have no other emotional relationship with me those are the contractual conditions he put before his wife for continuing his marriage he cheated on her also he married his her sister and then again cheated on her also and then he is also uh, said to have cheated on the research work of his wife, who was a bright, who was brighter in maths as compared to Einstein himself. Einstein was not great at maths. And he had worked his theories on the basis of the mathematical propositions that his wife had brought about, but she didn't get any credit of it. So a lot of that again. transformed how we look at uh, our telephone uh, 
I, uh, cell phones today, you know, he created an emotional connect between the man and the machine. Machine, but then he was a uh, he was a very terrible leader. You know. Hello. Yeah, Pawanji. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, this call was urgent, yeah. Okay. Right. So what I was saying is that uh, Steve Jobs, for example, you know, his leadership was terrible. Would you believe that uh, he was fired from his company by the CEO who was appointed by Jobs himself? So much so. So it's a matter of debate, discussion, and then apart from his personal behavior and conduct, his business ethics were also highly questionable. The uh, kind of derivative contracts that he had, the uh, kind of uh, labor policies for his China outlets that he had. So a lot of issues uh, with him, you know, about his leadership, you know. But then he is one of the greatest leaders that have transformed the current world, you know. Right. So basically, the idea is that the leadership theories have always given us a, a picture of a virtuous leadership. But there's some kind of empirical data on the other side of the divide also. You know. Right. So the question that arises and I raise in the book is that does it pay to be a jerk? In practical life, we have seen that kissing up and kicking down Narcissism, self-promotion, deliberate display of authority and power leads to, often leads to leadership success also, you know. But leadership literature completely ignores these things. You know. So what we need to study today is a, uh, is a wrong understanding of leadership. Because what happens, you know, that when a question, what is leadership, we are not given a straight answer we are given a, a normative answer. A leadership, what is leadership uh, should invite an answer as to what exactly on the ground is. But what we get is what is good leadership. You know? What should be a good leader, you know? a lot of difference. You know? When you say what should be a good leader, all the 10, 12, 20 traits he should have, but when you see it on the ground, well, this is far from the reality. You know? Now, that's why I say that leaders are imperfect and we should focus on imperfect leadership. Now, what is the imperfect leadership? Now, imperfect leadership is that leaders are aware and they acknowledge their imperfections. You know. And at the same time, they have visible and demonstrated strengths and they work on their strength. They perform on their strength and they get their, on their results on the basis of their strength, forgetting their weaknesses, you know, ignoring their weaknesses. You know. So what happens when as a leader, you accept your weaknesses, that you set right the expectations of your team from you. If I say that I'm not good at communication and then I uh, flounder about my communication, then people will not, will not laugh at me. If I say that I'm not good at IT, I'm not good at investment, people not expect, will not expect investment guidelines from me or IT guidelines from me, right? So as a leader, it pays me, setting right the expectations from me. Number two, when I'm aware of my weaknesses, imperfections, and when, the, uh, when I have acknowledged it to, before others, then I start looking for that missing talent from outside, maybe outside the company or outside uh, my team, I start looking for that, uh, this thing, you know, um, that attribute from, so that my team becomes a uh, perfect team. You know. As a leader, I may be imperfect, but my effort must be that my team should become perfect. So whatever are my imperfections, whatever are my weaknesses, I should try to fill in those imperfections I mean, 
substitute those people in my team who have those strengths. So that's the purpose of this. So, and then on that basis, what happens that uh, leadership becomes a group activity, not individual. Today, leadership is perceived to be, presented to be individual heroism. What is your uh, image of a leader, a corporate leader, for example, you know? A company is floundering, going down the hills, profits are gone, employees are demotivated, and then comes a leader, he restructures the company, he uh, fires some employees, he employs some new ones, gets a new vision, gets new SOPs, and then makes a turnaround of the company. As if it's made a single person's heroism. You know. Leadership is not a single person's act, it's a group activity. Basic second focus that I want to make it. It's a group activity. The next thing I would say that why I'm saying that the age of the imperfect leader. Gandhi was imp imperfect in the previous age. Donald Trump is imperfect today. But why is it that this is the age of imperfect leaders? Why is it mandatory for you to become imperfect? Because the times have changed. We are in the VUCA world. VUCA, as you know, it is defined as volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and uh, ambiguity. You know. There's a tremendous volatility in the uh, atmosphere. Every day, the operating landscape keeps on changing. I will not, for paucity of time, I will not uh, go into details of it. There's uncertainty about what is going to happen tomorrow. If I take a decision, what is going to be its impact? Complexity is there because too many triggers are there. Too many factors are interwoven, uh, right? If President Obama, uh, sorry, President Trump takes an active uh, action against China, if a uh, uh, if a flood comes in Thailand, the Indian manufacturing gets impacted because we are too much complex, complicated, interwoven structure globally we have become, you know. And so there's a lot of ambiguity. It becomes difficult for people to guess which are the triggers for an uh, incident. There's a lot of ambiguity about it. And what will exactly happen if I take a particular action? That ambiguity, you know. Then, you know, IT is ushering in an open and uh, transparent environment. You know. Today, there are no hiding places for leaders. You know. If you were in the yesterday's economy, it was not transparent, it was stable, it was very slow. Somebody wrote a postcard to you and waited for 15 days for a reply. Today, he gives you an email and expect order on the Twitter and uh, expect reply on the next moment. You know. And then uh, your profile of your company, your own profile, your own activities, everything is exposed on the internet, you know, on various uh, websites. You know. So there are no hiding places for leaders, you know, right? IT has done, done yet another important thing, you know, uh, two important things I would say. Uh, one is that while uh, law and regulations and countries are still struggling with their boundaries, national boundaries and sovereignty. IT has gone all beyond that, you know. Defying sovereignty, defining, defying national boundaries. We are in a global market today. That's one thing. Second thing, the IT has given the power to the individual. Earlier, what the empire, the organization was the source of information. The organization used to tell, tell you, look here, this is my product. This is the benefit and used to lap that information and take that information. You had no other uh, way out. Today, the customers are saying this product is good, this product is bad. And you remember the Vodafone incident where one gentleman uh, complained against Vodafone services. It was in 2011. And Vodafone went to the extent of lodging a police complaint against the gentleman, you know. And the social media, there was so much of upsurge on the social media against the telecom apologize and compensate to the uh, complainant. So that's the power that IT has given to the, uh, to, the uh, to the individual, right? Then we are in a post-truth era where there are no absolute facts. Leaders float some ideas, followers jump onto that, they endorse it. We see it happening in every day. It has no connection with truth. It has no connection with reality, you know changing profile of customers, the new age workforce, it's all changing. Customers expectations are changing, workforce expectations are changing. And then there's a breakdown of systems, you know. There are breakdown of uh, 
systems one ilfs goes down and the whole uh, impact uh, is felt by the whole economy you know everywhere mutual funds are impacted stock market is impacted uh, you and me everybody gets impacted right so systems are crumbling crumbling but there are no time for preparing for responses in the earlier days you remember in the 80s i believe or 70s when suraj paul wanted to raid uh, the indian companies dcm and one more company he was prevented from doing that you know and the court case is protected for uh, ages and ultimately suraj paul had to go back eat a humble pie but today it's not possible if you buy a share you got to register it right so there you need to have instantaneous responses failure to respond quickly you have seen in the maggie noodle case how within 15 days the entire country banned maggie noodles because the uh, nestle india couldn't come out with appropriate response you know right so in this kind of situation if you try if a man sitting at the top tries to look perfect and he tries to uh, control all the activities of the corporation in a global setup it's not possible he will fail he will not be accepted and it will be a disaster so there's a need for everybody to be to accept his imperfections there's no other way out and create a team which has the strength which are not there in the main leader what i want to convey is that there's no need to be perfect or uh, to inspire others leaders inspire but there's no need to be perfect how you manage your imperfections is the point of inspiration for the others and if you continue leading today with the methods of yesterday rest assured you would be out of leadership tomorrow that's the message that i want to give now what is the alternative so what i'm saying is that what we should be doing is that we should be leading by our strengths so leadership is basically excellence in perfection perfection is one when we create a situation where i i am become perfect i don't have any imperfections no it's not leadership leadership is excellence whatever strength you have work on that strength make it an excellent reach excellence there and you will be recognized as a leader people will start listening to you for the, your leadership you know and why i am saying this to make your strength productive and weaknesses you should make it irrelevant you know why so because when you work on your strength it's easier for you to succeed you know it's more inspiring it's more motivating because it it becomes more rewarding and when you work on your strength something that you want to do you can do then uh, you get better results people uh, encourage you you get praise you get recognition you get rewards and you try to do it again and again in the process it becomes your excellence your initial talent becomes your strength so that's that's the reason as in as this when you work on your weaknesses then it's very frustrating you don't want to do that you know it's frustrating you get disheartened you know dissipated your energy gets dissipated you know and the time and energy you put on weakening your weaknesses if you apply the same thing to managing your strength strengthening your strength you will get more results you know there are uh, corporate example may, made many studies where they have shown one of the leading studies shows that if you address your employees based on your strength on their strength on the employee's strength the productivity goes up by 36.4% you know on strength uh, on their strength means the areas in which they have a strength you give them those job assignments review their jobs on that basis and uh, productivity goes by 36.4% as in as this when you review them on their weaknesses their productivity goes down by 26.8% you know so there's a difference of about 64% between when you address the employee's strength and you address their weaknesses right 
so this is what and there are a lot of sociological research on this robert martin did one ex experiment on scientists which said that uh, look uh, the science result the scientists who had early success in their life they got much more in the later life also likewise this uh, research was followed by a 25 year research on uh, a sociologist from 1979 to 2004 they picked up 6700 boys and girls in the age of 14 to 21 studied them for 25 years and discovered that people who started with early success based on their strength they were earning in 2004 after 25 years much higher than those people who had a low start right those who were who were working on who didn't have tasted who didn't taste initial success you know at the beginning of their career their health was conditions were also better you know so that that's the kind of a research wider research has proved so it's better to work on your strength and then get the results so how do you identify your strength i discuss these issues uh, is that uh, basically uh, there are subjective methods you know what you are good at what you feel pleasure in doing uh, ask your friends ask your colleagues what you are good at there will be a definitely a match between these two and then support it with objective methods that you have so many psychological tools assessment tools which tell you what are your strength and they are free of cost I spend 2000 or 4000 rupees and they give you for example gallup gives you a very detailed analysis for 4000 rupees of all your in, uh, strength the benefit of this is that you come to know whatever your hidden strengths are there which you may not have known you come to know what your hidden strength is so next step will be uh, you work on those strengths you practice those things there are a lot of experiments which have gone particularly i will refer the cambridge hang, handbook of expertise and expert performance it says it visibly it's very uh, clearly demonstrates that even the best of the artists or the scientists or the mathematicians it has been a matter of practice practice and practice and one of the conclusions is that the guy who uh, rehearsed and practiced for 2000 hours in his life is a singer in a club the guy who rehearsed for practice for 5000 hours is a uh, is a uh, musician in an orchestra and the guy who rehearsed for 10000 hours in his life he is a solo performer on the stage you know and that's the difference practice makes you know so that's a beautiful book uh, that I it's by anderson uh, erickson anders erickson the next to practicing is the coaching you need coaching you need expert guidance you know whatever you are even ceos no need coaching and uh, even the uh, most famous ceos have undergone coaching they have uh, regular coaching even uh, rafael nadal or uh, federer have coaches you know. so there's nothing wrong by getting coached we should get coached and the next step stage will be self coaching uh understand what are the things that you have done well repeat it in different situations and keep on repeating again and again you know likewise understand what somebody else has done uh well and try to repeat that that's the self coaching you know. so this is um uh the nutshell that i would say working on a strength you should develop your strength where uh and not only you should confine this approach to you, this you should extend this approach a strength based approach to your people strategy also you should judge your people on your on their strength when you recruit people it should be on their if their strength matches with the need of your company you know what happens when we promote people we promote people based on the past performance if a salesman has done very good sales we promote him to a sales supervisor manager you know no he may not be a good sales manager you know his skills are a sales man's skills you know? so you need to identify a person and then match with your requirement you know uh so uh 
then in the book i have also uh, discussed some of the leadership requirements uh, in the current for success in the current world you know and i have five things that i have listed are that leaders are dream merchants that basically uh, the first thing is that leaders are dream merchants basically they are visionaries you know i will go fast on this and creating a vision is uh, the the because leaders change direction their leaders provide and that sense they are drastically different from managers that's the basic difference between leadership and management <clears throat> so leaders provide you direction and for providing direction vision you know but the commonly understood understood point of vision is two things you know and that i discount this myth one is that the vision has to be lofty no vision all visions need not be lofty it could be just a process improvement or it could be just a product development which does some good to the customer brings down the cost of the company makes makes the ease of business uh, better so that could be a vision because leadership again is not always at the top of the company leadership is distributed all across the cadres of the company they all at all levels and depending upon the role and profile the leader is uh, what kind of vision he will have so it need not be lofty or shattering like mukesh ambani's vision or elon musk's vision you know or that amazon man's vision it need not be you know. uh the uh, need not be the origin of a vision also need not be very very lofty i have referred one case and detail uh, in detail i have discussed the case of bill wilson you know alcoholic anonymous you know. he was a troubled alcoholic to the extent that he was on death bed hospitalized repeatedly and for years together he struggled fighting his alcoholism and then uh, in one of his dreams he discovered that he had been given redemption by god and then he was inspired he had lost all his business he had lost his family everything he had lost in the company of dr s smith that alcoholics put together they can prevent al they can inspire other alcoholics to refrain from alcoholism and he wrote a book and then that's the book that has inspired christian today so he's a he is not much celebrated but he's a person who's in sheen and it's not about alcoholism his book was followed by how to get uh, rid of uh, drug addiction and many many other things you know so that's the thing i have discussed about uh, that vision normally our perception of vision is that first we the leader creates a vision collates it down to the followers and then uh, this is acted upon it's not always true take for example the gramin bank example where the professor yunus first went around the village of jarba and then he found the poverty and women uh, very abject uh, condition you know and there he uh, gave them some loan of 26 dollars or something and they came back after some time making a small profit minuscule profit you know and that gave him the idea that okay this can be done and that's when of the gramin bank came take another example make a wish foundation you know there was a 13 year old boy, old boy who was terminally terminally ill and uh, the his wish was that he wanted to become a policeman you know? so with the help he was flown to the police headquarters a, a police uniform was stitched for him and he was trained uh, to be a police inspector for a day and he lived like a uh, policeman you know he died there after some time you know but then this incident alone created a make a wish foundation you know and today it has uh, its branches in dozens of countries you know went in so leaders are basically dream merchants they dream they create dreams for themselves for others for their organization also then they are like collaborate collaborators and co-creators you know gone are the days when one person at the top could command the entire 
uh, organization. You, know. you need to embed leadership, distribute leadership all across the uh, organization, vertically as well as horizontally. You know. So that leadership uh, is felt at every point because today in a global setup, you can't uh, take you can't decisions by the man to part. And I have discussed a couple of examples, you know, a very interesting example. One of the examples that I've discussed there is uh, the uh, example of Major Litul Gugoi. You all remember the major Indian Army major who uh, tied up a person in Jammu and Kashmir in Badgaon district during the election season uh, on top of a jeep and brought his team, the election team, and uh, pers police personnel out of safety without any bloodshed. You know. I have discussed that. You know. So this is one aggressive behavior. And now initially what happened that his action was condemned by even the uh, army generals, retired generals, of course. They said this is against the Indian Army SOP, but they realized SOPs of the army work during peace time. During war time, there is no SOP. Every moment the situation changes and you create, got to create your own SOP. You sometimes need to work two cadres higher up because your higher up may have been shot dead. So uh, the SOPs don't work in war situations. And what we have saw there at that point of time, we're trying to burn these people, police situation. And the major took an instantaneous decision forgetting about his SOP and all the aggressive approach. You saw people walking in Kashmir on election duty in the Badgaon uh, punching them, teaching them, you know, and the CRPF people tolerance, patience, they didn't react. Right. Different leaders, different situations. You, know. you can't wait for the, uh, for what you call uh, the high command uh, or the army general to take a decision what to do now. You've got to decide. And similar situation happens in companies and organizations today also. You know. I will refer you to uh, one incident, uh, one excerpt. Uh, the Journal of Asynchronous it's an American publication for the American by the American Army, and which says leadership challenge. What would you do? And they give you different kind of situations for uh, learning leadership. Uh, so they give you different kind of situations, and they have described one situation which interested me. They had a platoon going in the streets of Iraq, war torn Iraq, all uh, in parade, and then a gang of Iraqis came out, ferocious hardy, strong, tough looking Iraqis with their angry faces, whining, shouting, they came up. And the terror, everybody in the American militia felt the terror there. Shaking. You can make out from the video that he was literally shaking out of terror. And then what the captain said there, you know, he said, guns down, kneel down on your knees. Now nobody believed him. What's happening? How can the captain give this kind of thing? Kneel down, guns down, you know. But gradually everybody did it. The Iraqis were pacified and they went back home. You know. That's a lesson. Another lesson they give you, if you are in a helicopter on a surveillance mission, <clears throat> reconnaissance mission, <clears throat> and you see that there's a man, is uh, hands tied behind his back and there are two, three people with a gun to shoot him. What will you do? Will you shoot the gunman? Would, number one. Or would you uh, land your helicopter and challenge them and rescue the person? Or would you uh, leave without doing anything? And remember you have very less fuel in your helicopter. What was the answer? All of us will give different and what the journal says, your answer is correct. 
you decide as per the situation moment has to be done and that's what leadership is today there are no sops to be followed depending upon the situation you take to be done what is best for the organization right uh, so uh, when i talk about distributed leadership the obligation the job of leaders is to create more leaders not create followers the days are gone when the leader's job was to create more followers no the job is to create more uh, leaders and embed them at different points in the organizations leaders don't solve problems again a uh, different different point of view leaders don't solve solve problem they help the teams solve their problem teams to solve their own problems you know right and if when the teams do the uh, solve their own problems they uh, develop a collective self esteem uh, in the organization and that leads to their success you know. the next point that i discuss chintan i will take five more minutes you know to conclude you know. sure sir sure sir uh, yeah let agile jugglers leaders have to be today agile jugglers now what is agility first thing learning agile uh, i mean learning agility agility is a trait which leaders must have in today's situation you know what is learning agility it's the ability to learn unlearn and relearn in the new situation you know? because we are in a situation is not always a guide to your future behavior if you have been there have been lot of cases of japanese managers leaders going to us and failing there because they were they were perceived to be too passive too collaborative and lot of american managers or australian managers coming to japan or india and failing because they were supposed to be too aggressive i remember the case of one uh, uh, composer um, he is uh, heading a israeli orchestra talgam he says during the 1990s when the soviet union had broken up a lot of musicians jews came from rushed away from ran away from soviet union and jew came to israel you know so he was uh, uh, some of them were part of their his orchestra and while rehearsing for a particular symphony talgam was not getting it right he felt that he was not getting it right and so he said that friends i'm not getting it right how should we do it there was a pin drop silence and one of the guys from russia who had migrated to israel he said in the country where we have worked earlier the conductor would know how to do it now talgam says that he wanted to honor his team that look here i am giving you an opportunity to come out with your creativity and tell me what to do i am empowering you but then the expectation of the team was different you know so again there's no standard uh, operating procedure for leadership you got to define and decide according to the opportunities so mental ability to learn and uh, relearn it's a meta competency now uh, learning agility is a meta competency and what do i mean by meta competency meta competency is something which if you learn that if you have that competence competency that opens up the door for many other competencies for example reading is a meta competency if you know how to read you can learn how to, about many things you can learn maths you can learn literature you can learn science you can learn management and thing so reading becomes a meta competency likewise learning agility is a, a meta competency and it uh, it involves in today's situation examining your past experiences and re-modifying re and reapplying to the current situation so that's uh, the role of learning and learning agility leads you to leadership agility as leaders today in a situation you may be in a startup for example you know now managing as uh, managing a uh, uh, study is completely different from managing a startup the nimbleness of a startup and the stability of a standard company a stabilized company are two different skill sets 
Now, when you move from an established company to a startup, you got to unlearn, relearn, and your previous experiences used to reapply in a modified manner. You know? So that's the leadership ability. And then, friend, you know, it, uh, what it says that organizations today have diff six different phases from uh, inception to maturity. And then as leader, you got to keep on changing your leadership skill according to that. For example, um, not only organizations, but even a group set, for example, a Reliance group of industry, if you have worked there. At, at the different companies in the group are at different stages of maturity. Someone is, something is at a start stage, for example, or retail could be slight maturity. Uh, L is of course a mature company. Now these different situations, different companies require different kind of leadership skills. And so either you should have it, you should be able to apply this, or you don't have those skills. You should deploy a team. You should in your team have people with skills who can manage that. You know. Then the next thing I've discussed a lot of examples uh, about champions of diversity and inclusion. Leadership leaders have to be champions of diversity and inclusion. I've discussed examples from Goldman Sachs. They promote LGBT. ICSA Bank. They promote women in a big way. Uh, Stancy. They have done a great job for the blind and many stream them. And likewise, leaders have to be inventors of the future. Now, the two things about the invention, quality of invention today, that I would like to say, that uh, today invention is not about uh, bringing perfection. Uh, you remember some, a few decades back, Japanese used to be the master of inventions. You know? They used to take 10, time, 10 years time to perfect a product and then launch in the market. What happens today? You don't launch a, a perfect product today. You, everybody, ev you look at iPhone, for example, or iPads. Every generation of iPhone or iPad has an incremental improvement. None of them are perfect, you know? right? So. Uh, likewise, any product, because the reason is that if you wait for perfection, Samsung will come and take away the market. So, but trying to gain excellence, when iPhone was launched in 2007, it was not the perfect phone. It had a lot of problem about connectivity. It had a lot of other problems, right? But incrementally, it to the place. Incremental improvement, improvements came, you know. So there is always, you know, incrementalism about uh, innovations. But whatever you do, you should, at that point of time, there was no phone uh, like iPhone when it was launched. So there was excellence, but it was not perfect. So that's one change that has happened. And then uh, you have Google uh, innovation, you know, doing more with less. The Western innovation is highly cost, uh, costing too much. It's generated for select few, like an iPhone or iPad. And only when it gets the scale, economy of scale, then it starts uh, lowering down to the, its prices. This you have doing more for it because the world has limited resources. <coughs> so uh, within those resources, you uh, give your output and do it for the best people for the best. Okay. Uh, so the last point that I would like to say is you must focus on results. There are no right methods or right uh, wrong methods. There are only right goals, right objectives, right achievements. Nobody remembers a general who was highly moral, highly disciplined, followed all his SOP, but never won a war. Right. We remember generals who won, who win wars. Uh, in management circles, if you look at, uh, sometimes we say customer centricity, somebody says employee centricity, somebody says shareholders profitability first, and, I, and Apple product centricity. You know, I make the best product so that customer wait for my product even at the 12 o'clock in the night, you know, queue up for the product. You know. So there are no right methods, there are no wrong methods, and success, you should work for the results, you know. 
be a principal pragmatist couple of points i will leave here because uh, short of time now i would say uh, something which they don't teach you at uh, leadership institutes be a principal pragmatist right don't be theoretical about your uh, idealism and all that expand your power base now uh, this again is not taught to you and incrementally they have uh, in leadership position they have grown their power base and then today they are in commanding position balance the if ethics and effectiveness trade off uh there's always a dilemma because leadership institutes always tell us that you should be ethical they never tell us that every great leader right from abraham lincoln to narendra modi to everybody has strayed off the ethical path for a moment doused some temporary fire and came back to the main route so long as your main agenda remains intact your goal remains intact you should be ready to sacrifice some of your ethical trade offs you know how uh, well uh, build your leadership great uh, that's important so the my final message will be that focus on your strength uh, remember you always uh, get better with your strength you get better results quicker results with your strength i'll just give the example of madonna she didn't have when she started she didn't have the best voice in the world but rather than working on her voice she worked on her stage performance and look here a star was born right so just focus on your strength manage your weaknesses you know i would don't say that ignore your weaknesses if your weaknesses are life threatening manage it, improve it to a level where it's no longer life threatening and then leave it as that and there are different methods of managing your weaknesses getting over your weaknesses getting a roundabout way of addressing your weaknesses and the last point and the most important point i would say is that listen to your authentic self whatever your passion is there it should get reflected in your leadership you can't imitate somebody else's passion you won't be looking original nobody will be convinced about your leadership and you will fail whatever you are passionate about it whatever you believe in you be yourself and believe in yourself only then you can succeed as a leader so these are the final words friends and i'm um, uh thankful for the patient listening i will wait for some questions if there are any thank, thank you. you so much thank you so much thank you pavan ji uh we have couple of questions queued up uh i would request kunal to share his question kunal kunal wadia go ahead hello am i audible yeah yeah perfect yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you pavan ji for this uh, insightful uh, session uh, welcome so while you were talking you know about you know, sharing those uh, examples and all uh, i had this question that popped up in my mind that what happens when a leader ignores his weaknesses mm. and to focus on his strengths that you had covered in the earlier part of the session yes wherein uh, you know and in due course that ignorant you know or ignored weakness the severely impacts uh, his core strength and then eventually he loses out so that's uh, you know a little confusing so instead of saying ignoring the weakness uh, could we say acknowledging the weakness and not letting it eat, eat up your strength to that the point that you just mentioned like 2 minutes back all right you see uh, for paucity of time i didn't uh, deliberate on weaknesses and uh, is that manage your weaknesses right there are different ways of managing your weaknesses for example uh, i uh, if i am very bad at making a presentation i don't uh, like to face people but i am good at uh, prepare then what i can do is that i can ask somebody in my team that he should make uh, make the presentation and while i will prepare it within a team i should assess the strength of my teammates and everybody should be given a job based on uh, the strength so that everybody works on his strength and my weaknesses don't get ignored uh, for example i have given a, an example uh, of a pharma company in uh, uh, the book where you know there was one gentleman uh, that pharma company had when it was very good at publicity was getting all the time top publicity you know 
and then the manager the brand manager uh, uh, sorry he resigned and went away you know the next in line who was put there was not very good at uh, brand management you know but he then he what happened that he uh, used his another skill he had a great people skill so what he used to do whenever the event was there he would go to a newspaper uh, uh, press around 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock in the night when all the senior editors sub editors after fixing everything had gone and then he would ask the last man there to insert a photo there with a small text no, no, photo you know, 6000 times than uh, text so that was the way he was managing so you take no, recourse no, no, no. alternative strengths for managing your weaknesses i'm not no. saying ignore acknowledge your weaknesses and then get into your team somebody who has the strength in the area of your weaknesses so that when you work as a team then you're stronger your team becomes a perfect team while you remain imperfect your team becomes perfect i hope i have answered your query yes you did sir thank you so much i had another one i think i don't know if i have time chintan bhai for that quick uh, last uh, question hello yeah carry on i think so so uh, what did you ask how do you differentiate uh, you know self coaching from leadership of imitation because that's something that's a uh, you know very deceiving uh, line of work wherein you know you find something really inspiring and uh, you start to uh, you know imitate unknowingly which you had again covered in your uh, session yes. but you know also the part that you know uh, let's say if you want to imbibe that as an trait within you hmm. uh, you know it's in a way it's a self coaching right so how do you differentiate that because that's not your strength okay uh, let me clarify you know when i supposing i'm inspired by your leadership okay i get inspired by your vision i get inspired by your strategy i get inspired by your plan of action i get inspired by how you interact with your people and all that you know right the problem happens its inspiration is good all of us are inspired but when i imp- start implementing your style in my company then because leadership is highly contextual i will give you the example of uh, two stalwarts steve jobs and uh, uh, the founder of microsoft right now they were all the same age same time same industry but you look at each other's uh, strength steve jobs was completely different and bill gates is completely different bill gates is a team player and he uh, extracted the best out of his employees is and so much so that he created a universal computer system where any people even without a skill can use a computer successful uh, apple founder uh, contrary had his personal strength he was not a team player you know he had his personal strength now he translated his innovative innovation skills into his product and class product and the apple corporation you know now the point is here that assuming that bill gates was inspired by uh, steve jobs and started behaving like steve microsoft what would have, would he be able to create a uh, microsoft organization or if steve inspired by uh, microsoft leader bill gates and started imitating microsoft leader bill gates in his company both of them would have been both of them realized their own strengths they appreciated each other highly appreciated each other but both of them realized their own strength and applied their own strength because their situations were different leadership is contextual to the uh, uh, to the company that you are uh, to the landscape business la- operating landscape in which you are operating churchill and mahatma gandhi for example they were both in the same age but do you think they could have uh, uh, imitated each other's style no because it was contextual mahatma gandhi is the father of transformation leader but do you think today i can imitate anybody can imitate mahatma gandhi's style 
No. Because I guess you are inspired by Mahatma Gandhi. But can you imitate Mahatma Gandhi in your uh, company? Not the way. Can you start a non uh, satyagraha <laughs> and build the and <laughs> non cooperation movement in your company? Inspire. But look at the circumstances of your company demand and look match it with your core strengths and your team's strengths and. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, there was a query from Brigadier Ramakrishnan. Uh, sir, would you like to share your query? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, sir, for a very, very nice talk on leadership. Thank you. And uh, I learned a lot of new things, though we have been taught leadership right from the age of 20, because the battlefield uh, was always VUCA. And yeah. uh, you also, uh, I mean, we are trained to have some kind of a junior leadership and you quoted a lot of examples from the military also. And uh, you told us a lot of things finally about uh, things which are not even taught in uh, leadership schools. Very interesting talk, definitely. But my question is about, you said uh, a leader can acknowledge his weaknesses and maybe in places where he doesn't have the skill, say a finance or in the IT, he can cultivate a team which can, you know, advise him and hmm. take it forward. Now, my question is that most of the leaders have a stamp, a typical stamp on which, you know, they impress their followers and carry forward and the people follow it, follow them based on their typical style or a style or a stamp of leadership. So how does a leader impart his stamp on various uh, fields where he is not a qualified person by taking an advice from his team or subordinate or somebody and then, you know, sells it to his people? Yeah. See, the role of a leader is entirely different from the role of the subordinate members. You know. It's completely different. The leadership is for example, it provides a vision, it provides a direction. And if you are to provide your direction to your people, to your team, and the team plays a supportive role there. You know. For example, you are the head of a company. And then what you will do is that, for example, let me take a live example today. A Mukesh money for that. When he launched the Geo, Reliance Geo, do you think he understand the in integrity of technology, he wanted, but then what he had, and why I admire Mukesh Ambani as a very uh, free leader, is that you know, he has the vision. So he thought that can we communicate, uh, can Indians communicate with one another at the cost of a postcard? Communication be made easy and accessible to average Indian, you know. That was the thought process, that was the vision, right? A big vision, the helicopter view that I would say that he had, you know. Then his team, his technology team, his startup team, everybody put in the out this thing. It has a role of synthesizing it and then putting it into a concrete plan with the help of his team. He, we are not looking some money for finance expertise, for a uh, process expertise or operational expertise, excellence or so, no. I'm looking at him for the vision that he has, for the, he's the best project executioner, implementer in the country today that we have, you know. Or for that matter, any leader, you know. Take uh, any leader uh, uh, today. So it is, the leader's role is to give, synthesize all the perspective and then create a vision and lead you towards that vision, right? Uh, for example, let's uh, take, for example, the current, I don't want to discuss politics because it becomes controversial, but for example, how difficult it was for the entire country, all 30 states to agree to a common platform. But then there was somebody and I would credit 
uh, of course, Narendra Modi gave the leadership and the go ahead, but then much of the credit goes to Arun Jaitley, who was a hard negotiator at the same time, who could put everybody together, synthesize everybody's perspective. In the process, some of the produce manufacturing estates had to sacrifice, some of the non manufacturing estates had to make some compromises, and they came to a com uh, platform, common platform. The GST concept. It's one of the innovations has not been sung about, you know, talked about, because it's one platform where the entire country comes, irrespective of the political difference of political leadership and the, uh, philosophies, they come together and take dis, uh, decisions in the interest of the country. Good or bad, that's not my uh, concern, you know. GST may be good, GST may be bad, this could be our different opinion. Here is a leader like Mr. Modi, the Prime Minister of India, who uses his team synthesizes all the opinions and then gives you the go ahead and the success is doing at the same time his failures are there you know. on the land reorganization bill he failed he couldn't carry on because of the opposition so much of opposition was there you know from the public as well as from political parties for whatever reason it is good or bad i'm not then leaders are known by the results so if they give you the results Yes, fine. They are leaders. You don't worry about their weaknesses. You don't worry about their, uh, you know, uh, their knowledge or expertise in specific areas. I hope I have answered or anything. No, thank you. Thank you. That means the leader has to, in any case, define his vision and put that as a stamp on all the policies. Thank you so much. I will definitely read your book. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brigadier Sir. Um, do we have any other question from other participants? Samir Birenbhai Gukle Sir, good to see you. Good evening. Uh, Chandar Malik Sahab, Vaibhav Kamal Amit Rajeshi. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we had our first webinar of 2019 series. I would request uh, Rajesh Saveji to uh, share a vote of thanks on behalf of all of us. Uh, Rajesh ji. Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Uh, first of all, uh, yes, uh, Pawanji, uh, you know, it was... Uh, a completely, uh, you know, uh, I would say very global perspective on leadership because you touched upon almost every facet of leadership which is being talked about. And definitely, yes, uh, strength-based leadership is, uh, you know, something which is uh, coming up in the recent times and, uh, and people are talking about it that you rather strengthen your strengths, which uh, even in experiments in, in psychology and sociology have proved that is very is relatively easy to strengthen the strengths rather than working on the weaknesses, which uh, a very interesting perspective, Pawanji, and I sincerely appreciate because most of us HR professionals in organizations are more worried about, uh, you know, your individual development plans are completely driven by weaknesses. So we try to, uh, you know, work on weaknesses, yes. prepare our training programs for weaknesses, which is a misnomer, you know, as per the new thing. And I think that's a fantastic takeaway for today. Uh, even personally, all of us, uh, we are always worried about our weaknesses and start, uh, you know, thinking about weaknesses. And then even as a leader, and we are leader in all re respects, you know, all, all respects of life. So yes. I think that's that was the biggest takeaway for me personally uh, for this evening. Uh, and the rest of the examples are perfect. You know, when you spoke about nobody remembers general, uh, who is very ethical, who is very sincere and whatever, but people remember generals who have won the war. I mean, how many of us will... If if uh, this group is asked at the point in time, just says, tell us the the most famous general general that you remember at this point in time. I think the first number will probably come is Sam Manekshaw and then Karyappa, and after that nobody else remembers. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, and these two guys have really done. You know, they've won wars and they you know Karyappa of course was the first general. So I think very good perspective, uh, very I quite a few eye openers. Uh, thank you so much, and Chintan Bhai. I mean, hats off to you for picking up Pawanji as as an organization. Uh, you know, 
practice. I was very happy to see almost, you know, I think 26 or 27 out of 30 who had confirmed joined. Uh, I think that's that's a very big uh, success rate for Chintan Bhai, for you. For, yes, for both of you, I sincerely, you know, uh, appreciate your efforts uh, and looking forward to many more such things. And uh, Pawanji, if you don't mind, we can connect one-on-one for, uh, you know, discussions on leadership, which is also my personally favorite. So I hope you don't mind, uh, you know, even any of our group members can connect with you one-on-one -on -one basis. So, uh, most welcome. Anybody, I'm open to connecting with anybody on one-to-one -one basis also. Thank, thank you so much and well spent evening, Chintan Bhai. Looking forward to many more such Saturday evenings to make our Sunday and, and weekend better. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank and you. Thanks, Chintan Bhai. Chintan Bhai, thank Thanks you very much. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.